This session is, uh, I think, one that's of increasing importance to members, especially as the barometers that we do on a quarterly basis at Visa start to suggest that actually the UK education market is likely to be flat or perhaps slightly down over the coming periods. And, you know, we're yet to, to really find out the impact of rather unexpected plans to exit the, uh, the European Union. But the one thing that I think is certain is that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty over the next periods. And actually, during the, the last recession, uh, a lot of our member companies who really did the best and flourished during that period were the ones that really started to look overseas and to develop the export opportunities that they, certainly the British education system and the halo effect uh, for suppliers uh, really makes the opportunities very rich there. So I'm really pleased to bring together a very strong panel to start to talk about those opportunities and then, of course, to take some of your questions. Speaking first will be Jeff Gladding, the Regional Director for UKTI Education. Jeff's been with UKTI Education for the three years in which it's been in existence and has really worked very, very closely with BISA's team to make sure that we maximise the opportunities for you to exhibit abroad, but also to give you some really strong intelligence about the best areas to, to, uh, and the best ways of doing so. So delighted that Jeff can make it here today. Also delighted to welcome a fellow BISA member to the stage, Diane Glass, who's the Director for Business and Higher Education at ISC Research. I'm really interested to hear your insights about the growing international schools opportunity for members. Um, and then last but very much not least, and, uh, <laughs> Andrew Whiteley, who's the Director General of World Didac. And World Didac is kind of like the BISA for BISAs all over the world, the Trade Association for Education Trade Associations worldwide. And he's going to talk about some examples of excellence and perhaps some examples of how we in the UK could be doing things better based on some comps around the world. So without further ado from me, if I can hand over to Jeff for your opening remarks. Sure. Thanks very much indeed, Patrick. And thanks very much indeed for the, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. As Patrick said, the, uh, the UKTI education team has been in existence now for just about three years, um, following on from our creation as part of the international education strategy for which David Willett was really very much at the helm. We've moved through a few iterations as, as the team has developed over those three years. We're currently pretty much focused around half a dozen key markets around the world or regions. I think you could probably broadly categorize them as being focused around Latin America, around Southeast Asia, around China, Hong Kong, and around the Gulf. That they're where we're really focusing our efforts, I think, over the, over the next years. But having said that, for, we're very, very keen indeed to support all BISA members, um, wherever you may be active around the world. And if the, the small central team in London uh, can't actually help you out, Sure as eggs is eggs, we'll find somebody who can either in a, an embassy or high commission or indeed via one of our international trade advisors who are dotted around the country near to where you may well be based. So, so we like to think that we can be helpful to the, uh, to the sector, um, no matter what you're trying to do. We do tend to focus, I would say, on the more strategic large scale education opportunities that exist around the world, where there is perhaps a government led program to perhaps introduce uh, some form of uh, educational technology or to um, perhaps uh, introduce English language to a much greater proportion of the population uh, or indeed to develop a vocational training system. And, and we've got a number of initiatives underway just at the moment uh, around how we can support the sector better. Some of you in the room may well have attended the, the BISA Launchpad events, um, which are events which BISA has been putting on with our support, really to try to encourage new companies into export, perhaps who haven't been active in, in exporting before. So we're very keen indeed to continue to do those, to not... Not to give you the completely unvarnished view of what export is like, but, but really to highlight some of the issues, some of the challenges, and some of the things you may need to think about as, a, as a, perhaps a smaller company entering the world of export for the first time. We're currently involved, and again, with, with BISA and other sector members' help to try to educate our people um, in embassies and high commissions around the world much better as to the capabilities of, of the sector and why overseas customers ought to be coming to the UK for their educational needs. And sometimes, you know, we've got colleagues around the world who are covering a whole range of things in embassies and high commissions. So we've got a bit of work to do here to, to educate them as to why the UK is absolutely the best. 
and Patrick and Caroline and the BISA team are helping us in, in how we do that. We're trying to do more to try and bring the sector together. We do hear quite a lot around the world that there are other countries who seem to manage to draw together different elements of their education system and present a more holistic, strategic, joined up offer to governments overseas. And we think that we might be missing a little bit of a trick in the UK by perhaps not doing that quite as much. So again, as we go forward, we'll be trying to do more of that. And I guess the final point about initiatives we're pursuing, we're really trying hard to think about ways in which we can do things differently where it makes sense to do so. We have a very kind of tried and tested way of kind of supporting companies to exhibit at exhibitions internationally, and that's fantastic, and we'll always continue to do that. But, you know, the world is changing, and we need to think about different ways that we can help much greater numbers of uh, organisations within the sector to be active internationally. And that's what we're very, very keen to do. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Chair. Diane, over to you. OK, thanks. Good morning, everybody. I'm here to concentrate on international schools. That's English, medium, international schools all around the world. The, the International School Consultancy has been researching these international schools now for 20 years. And we provide data uh, and market intelligence on the schools uh, to hundreds of, of businesses and, and uh, many businesses that are here today. We do it in a number of different ways. Because we've been working with international schools for so long, uh, we're the only organisation that can provide historic data on market growth and market trends. We also do a lot of work with the investment sector it is uh, certainly the most dynamic education sector in the world. There are, on our database at the moment, some 200 schools which are uh, in the planning stage or already under construction. And so there is uh, clearly you no know, huge amount of, in of investment going on. So we publish country-specific market intelligence reports which investors use as part of the commercial due diligence of their uh, investment projects. So that might be school groups, uh, independent schools in the UK and the US who want to open overseas or private equity companies. For businesses uh, belonging to BISA, uh, we provide direct connection with the international schools. Uh, and again, data and market intelligence uh, that helps them understand what is uh, an, an incredibly varied market. It's spread across 238 different countries or territories. Uh, each of them have their own uh, government policies, each of them have their own way of working. And within each of those countries, of course, there is a huge range of schools, whether they are uh, British schools overseas or American schools overseas or IB schools and even within the schools themselves uh, they are all teaching uh, a range of curricula offering a range of examinations so it's really important to have the right data in order to be able to understand the characteristics of the schools and how your products uh, best meet the requirements uh, of those schools so we provide uh, an online data platform uh, a real-time platform uh, continuously updated with our latest uh, research information so that our clients uh, have that data to hand uh, and can approach the right schools and make contact with the right decision makers at those schools. I've scattered around some information. There's a great case study on BrainPop, uh, one of our clients, uh, a great case study on how BrainPop began to approach the overseas market, having seen that things were flattening uh, in the United States first and then in the UK, if you're interested in, in reading that. How do we work? How do we collect the data? Well, we're based in Farringdon, just west of Oxford. And there we have a team of desk-based uh, researchers. And we also have a team of field research consultants across the world who visit personally about 800 schools each year. Uh, and they're based in... Um, Jeff's main regions, Latin America, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Eastern Asia, uh, and also Europe. Thank you very much, Diane. And finally, Andrew. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Director General of World Didac, and I've been in that position for six months. But prior to that, I've spent 30 years working in the educational 
exporting industry within the UK, running a number of uh, UK businesses. And then I spent three years working in Germany, in Cologne, with a number of German companies. And what I thought I'd do today is share and contrast with you the way the Germans do it and the way we do it, which is picking up a little bit on what Jeff has said. And if we look at the way the Germans export, the Germans export what they see as a, a supply chain. If you th we are one part of the supply chain within the educational equipment <clears throat> bit. But if you go up and down it, you've got teachers delivering, you've got infrastructure that they're delivering within. You've, we've got the schools, we've got the curriculum, we've got the, the awarding bodies. In Germany, they will, they will take a philosophy, and for technical and vocational education, they talk about the dual system, the apprenticeship system, which they operate in Germany, which is a, a partnership between industry and education. And they will sell that concept overseas, and they do it extremely well. And they have an organization, GIZ, many of you may have come across them, they act as a sort of consultancy. And if I go and talk to my German colleagues, they will, they, will, they will criticize GIZ because GIZ is very prescriptive about what it wants the suppliers to do. It basically knocks heads together. And, and, and it's the only way this type of partnership, in my opinion, can work because everybody wants to do as much as they can and, and they tread on one another's toes. So... Jeff and I were talking before we, we settled down to this, and, 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 and I think the UK, looking around this room now, we have the capabilities in this room to do projects, to offer complete solutions. We need to bring academia into it, and I'm keen to hear what people think about the changes with British Council. We need to bring the vocational colleges into it, the AOC, and we need to bring in the awarding bodies, Pearson, City and Guilds, at Excel, so that we can offer a complete solution that is a British solution. And we have a lot to say. We have a lot of success within our own education system. And, and I think offering a joined up package is the way to move forward. 30 years ago, when I started selling educational equipment, we went out with a product and it would be th that year's new development, and we'd take it out and we'd sell it. Now, we've, we've, we, 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 we sort of morphed into selling solutions. But I was in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago, and somebody in the Ministry of Education said to me, we don't want people coming to Saudi Arabia selling to us. We want people to come and be our partners. We want them to share our problems and find solutions. And then it's a win-win situation. And I think that philosophy of partnership um, dovetails very well with this idea of an holistic approach. With my other hat, I, I part-time work for World Dida. In the other uh, part of my life, I work in project finance. Um, and I've done projects with UK Export Finance, HSBC Bank, and with Euler Hermes Finance in Germany. We as a country are missing a trick. Somehow, we need to create a vehicle within the educational industry to pull people together in such a way that they can do large-scale projects. These are projects of 25 to 100 million pounds with UK export finance guaranteeing 85% of the value of the project, 15% done on normal commercial risk. And we have the capability in the United Kingdom to actually deliver complete educational solutions. And let's, let's do it using UK export finance. Thank you very much, Andrew. If I can go out to the floor now, are there any questions that people would like to ask the panel? We have Murray Hudson there. Murray Hudson from Grand Wars. We export to 68 countries. One of our big problems is the tariffs that we have to pay when we want to go to Brazil or India. And obviously, UKTI is now in a position to be negotiating these tariffs. <laughs> Could you tell us some views on what UKTI will be up to? Actually, I, I thought it would be about a minute and a half before the first Brexit <laughs> questions. I was really glad to come along today, actually, because as you can imagine, since last Thursday, I've just been sitting around on my hands, really. Not really, <laughs> really, 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 really much to do. 
I think it's, it's a very valid question and an entirely, you know, unsurprising one. Um, I think just at the moment, we are, as you would imagine, within government, getting our heads around the potential implications of this. And I couldn't agree with you more, you know, somewhere like Brazil, for example, which does seem to offer such a fantastic opportunity, but which nevertheless can be really, really challenging, particularly for a, a kind of first time exporter, if not for a more traditional exporter. You know, in the past, we've always suggested a kind of partnership approach uh, with with a local partner in somewhere like Brazil or somewhere like India, potentially, but that doesn't get over the particular issues. I think your your suggestion that 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 the government might be in a position to to operate slightly differently now um, is is a very relevant one, and as you can imagine, it's something that government is, you know, very actively considering just at the moment as to what the potential implications are and how we might operate slightly differently uh, in, in a new world. I can't really say too much more than that, as you might expect at the moment. Any other questions from the floor? I'd just like to ask what product and service lines are most associated with being excellent because they are produced by a British supplier? Well, so, so I guess, you know, in terms of kind of international schools uh, yeah. kind of across the world, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, the British education system is certainly very highly renowned. Which products and services do you think uh, international schools in particular are looking for? The international schools, we talk about education technology, first of all, and the international schools' acceptance and welcome of new technology, innovative uh, new products as far as education technology is concerned is, is second to none really. Ahead I think of a lot of independent schools here in the UK. The schools look for um, very high quality learning focused resources uh, primarily. The, the, the growth in the international schools market has been from local wealthy families. The, the, the percentage of expatriates using these schools has reduced from what used to be, you know, 80 odd percent down to 20, and now it's actually 80 percent of the students are from probably the top five percent of local wealthy families, um, and you know this this growth that, that has been because economies have boomed, people have the money to spend on better education, and they see the international schools as offering best quality education. So, high quality uh, uh, learning focused uh, products are, you know always on the agenda for the international school. So I would, I would say edu edu education technology, you know, really important. Thanks, Dan. I think we've got a question from Dominic Savage at the back there. I suddenly realised what fun it is having both Jeff and Andrew on, on this panel. <laughs> Andrew raised the issue of finding the sort of body that can lead large-scale contract work. And when I came into the industry in the late 70s, there were four large companies, um, all of them visa members, who were capable of fronting 50, 60, 70, 80 million pound projects. They've all fallen by the wayside. And we don't really have anyone with that direct capability within the private sector. And my question, I think, to Andrew is, from your experience of GIZ, are they the substitute in Germany for what our private sector players would have done here in the past? And sort of linking a question both to Andrew and Jeff, is there something that we ought to be doing between the industry and government in the UK to create some sort of body to front what are going to be an increasing number of opportunities as countries around the world are all desperate to improve their education systems? Andrew, if we get you first. Well, firstly, GIZ is a consultancy and, and they tend to offer the advice, but then they're very good at pulling together the team they need to, 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 to actually create and facilitate the project. Germany has a number of large project contractors and they work across multi-disciplines. They're not necessarily primarily involved in education. They might be involved in humanitarian aid projects one week, but the next week they're pulling together educational projects. Also, construction companies are very good at handling the complexity of pulling educational projects together because when you do a big educational project, it's about managing a supply chain. And 
construction companies are quite good at it. And I know from the early days of big projects, John Lang, the construction company, when, when I started in, in, in exporting, everybody wanted to go and visit John Lang because John Lang were the company for pulling educational projects together, particularly in the Middle East. We have, well, my reading of the market is there isn't a, a John Lang type organization. <clears throat> and, and, and I think as well, we've done some work at World Didac about who should be World Didac members. And everybody focuses on educational equipment suppliers, but we're now talking to banks. We're talking to OECD. We're talking to the providers of um, finance and leasing options. We're talking to construction companies and project managers about bringing them in to broaden the capability. Because if we think about the supply chain, if our, supply, our members want to go up and down the supply chain, then we need to bring in some other specialist skills. One of the things I'd like to do is create an internal market within World Didac to match and marry. We're an association, as you said at the reception at Lancaster House, associations are fragile things. And I've, I've learned that over the last six months. And dictating who does what within an association is a sure way of killing it off. But creating an internal market, bringing and facilitating the dialogue and letting everybody get on with it is very much my vision. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, just, uh just two, two answers, Dominic, really, I think. The uh, first one, um, and I won't use this kind of grouping, if you like, as the example for, you know, so as not to avoid embarrassing anybody, but um, well, we're currently working with the, the, the vocational sector in the UK who recognises amongst themselves quite openly that there's a fantastic UK offer somewhere there to be developed, but that somehow we seem incapable of actually stitching all the bits together to present that holistic offer internationally. Now, what individual bits of the sector have said, and these are big, you know, kind of organisations have said, well, perhaps this is something that because we don't seem to be able to do it together, perhaps government could kind of help us to do that. So, so we're, we're doing exactly that with, with the vocational sector. And, and of course, if, if we become aware of um, a, an opportunity internationally that, that requires um, that more strategic approach, then of course we'd be absolutely delighted to play a role in that. I should also mention that within government just at the moment, we do see around the world that there's, there's quite a lot of government to government contracting that takes place and, and certain governments around the world are, are very keen indeed and sometimes insist on actually government being the other contractor, if you like. Now, at the moment, the, uh, the UK appetite for that has been quite limited, really, in, in a very, very small number of instances. But there is some work around government just at the moment to try to extend that so that we will be in a better position to be able to offer that kind of G2G -G deal, which so many nations seem to require for, for major projects. Thanks, Jeff. I've, I've got a question for you, Diane. Uh, I mean, obviously, the international school sector is, uh, is growing very, very rapidly. I've heard talk that by the end of the decades, there'll be as many teachers teaching in international schools worldwide as there are in the UK at the moment. Um, uh, if you were a, a, a company new to exports and uh, looking to break into that emerging market, what advice would you give to them? Because, you know, uh, for all the talk of mats and how they procure, certainly, you know, it's even it's an even bigger can of worms, really, for international schools. So how would you go about just addressing yeah. that initially? Well, th the first thing to do is to, is to decide which schools you want to target so that rather than taking on the whole world, all 8,300 schools, you have a good look at you know, what you have to sell, or what you have to offer, and which schools it might best match. And that might be done geographically, or it might be done uh, by curriculum, might even be done by uh, size of school or, or the fees at the school. So it's a question of using the research data to carefully analyse, you know, which schools you want to approach, first of all. You might be selling from thousands of miles away. The really important thing is to find the right person at the school who's going to be interested in what you have to offer and establish a relationship with them. 
And then because the international schools are, you know, a community, uh, they might be a community within the US schools or they might be a community within a city. Once you begin to get uh, one customer or two, uh, there are lots of ways that you can really build on that uh, and begin to get some traction uh, within whichever sector it is uh, you're looking at, whether it is, you know, a, a country or a region uh, or it might be British schools or, or US schools, etc. Thanks very much. We have a question from Ji Li. Hi, uh, my name is Ji from Plum Innovations. Earlier, Andrew has mentioned about the buyers from other countries. They're looking for partners to share their problem and we find solutions for them. Most of the time, I mean, we have our own products or services. So we're looking for clients that are going to benefit from you know, our products or services. Any chance that actually, obviously, different countries have a different system, different problems. Maybe our products and uh, solutions are designed for UK system. And then in other countries, they have, might have different kind of problems. Is there any way we can find out what issues, like say in uh, Middle East or Asia, what kind of problem they have? So then we maybe can invent, or, or we're looking for a new solutions like that. Maybe we never have that before in UK, but we designed it for them. Mm -hmm. So is there any better ways we can find out what kind of solutions they're looking for? Well, I've, I've, I've long advocated if you want to go into a market, visit the market and... and uh, well, the thing is, as a small company, for sure. us, it's sure. very difficult to go out. Yeah, sure. so yeah. if we... Then the next way of doing that is, is, is to focus on exhibitions that are B2B. Um, you want to attend exhibitions that pull in the agents and distributors that are active in the markets that you're interested in. And my own organization hosts a biannual uh, event in Bern, and that will be pri the primarily primary focus of that exhibition is B2B. We, we are targeting agents and distributors from around the world and we bring them to Bern. The guys you need to talk to are the guys selling into the particular markets that you're interested in and they will have the, if they're any good, they will have the knowledge of the systems and standards that you need to adhere to in order to address your product correctly into that market. And that's probably a more cost-effective way of doing it. But don't do that without visiting. Once you've appointed agents, don't just abandon them and leave them to get on with it. People always say that the best agents are the best supported agents. And, and I think that's true. You, you, you appoint an agent and he is, he's as good as, as the time and effort you put into him. Thanks very much. I think we've got time for one more question at the back there. Sorry, I'm pushing in in front uh, of Dylan. But just more. to add to that point, actually, that's a really good point about the cost effectiveness of being able to go to international shows and something we can talk to you about, how we can do that with sort of UKGI um, grant funding for a number of things. But there is, particularly in the area you're working in, there's a feature called Trade at Bet, where distributors come to bet, particularly in the ed tech world, <laughs> that actually I think you're probably sitting next to some of the ladies who are working with that. So have a little chat over lunch, but sorry for butting in. Thank you. Dylan Jones, as well as the school governor, I'm the international strategy consultant for Follett. We've been very successful in selling to the private international school market, the market Diane was talking about. I'm very interested as to your comments as how we can move from that very successful market for, as an export of English language education, specifically British curricula, into working with um, the state sector across the world and how we can bridge that gap between the private and the state sector in different countries around the world. Great. Okay. Just, just in, uh, kind of 30 second kind of final comments well, well, uh, for, from each of the panellists. But one final question. Uh, Jeff mentioned the launch pad that we've been working with UKTI on over the last, um, uh, over the last three years, which mm -hmm. will be going from strength to strength again, working with BET and the BET Futures team this year. Um, but uh, we have a lot of companies in that launch pad, some of whom are here today, who are, uh, who are actually thinking about exporting for the first time. And uh, as well as responding to that question, it'd be very interesting just to hear any final thoughts about if you're a new exporter, uh, you know, how you might um, go, go about approaching that, uh, that, that challenge. So, Jeff, if I could start with you and we could just work along. Uh, sure. Uh, ju you. Just a, an initial comment about the, the jump between the, the private and the, and the state school sector, if you like. Obviously, market to market will vary. The remit of, of our people in high commissions, embassies is around the world. Uh, and it goes back to the, the earlier question that gentleman in front of me raised as well about how we keep on top of 
what it is that our our kind of markets around the world are actually looking for. I mean, we we try very hard indeed to encourage our people to actually engage with the key stakeholders within the ministries to try to have those kind of conversations about what it is they're looking for and what it is um, they're looking for and what solutions they need. Uh, and if I might also give a plug to our colleagues in eye to eye as well, who in advance of the major trade shows, for example, around the world, uh, do quite a lot of research around understanding what are the particular issues um, that are really uh, keeping the key stakeholders awake in Indonesia or Malaysia or whatever. And that, again, helps us to get a really good understanding within the state sector of what it is uh, they need from the UK and how we can best address it. Thanks very much, Jeff. Diane? Yeah, I, I would say that we work with companies who are, you know, very small uh, and then very large, like like Follett, and, and work with uh, lots of companies who are just beginning to um, export. But generally, the companies that come to us will have one or two clients overseas, and will have noticed that the you know there are big opportunities overseas with the international schools. It's easier to to deal with them, you know, because they're making their own buying decisions and you can deal with them in English and and they tend to have, you know, higher budgets. But it is really a question, I think, of of, of concentrating, deciding where you're going to uh, attack first and doing a really thorough, good job uh, in that particular area before you begin to uh, to move on and grow bigger and look at uh, look at new areas so it's it, it's really a question of concentration you definitely need to visit the market you need to think about uh, conferences that are going on having a presence you might want to think about linking up with international school associations they can be very helpful and give tremendous support as well uh, but do it all within a, a very focused area thank you Diane Andrew. In my six months at World Didac, I've tried to uh, meet as many and speak to as many of our members as we can. And, and I wanted to know what they wanted from an association like World Didac. And actually, a lot of the, the, the sentiment that's coming out of, of, of this session is very similar. I think exhibitions have probably three or maybe four roles to perform. The first one is B2B. We mentioned that earlier but the other the next one is probably b to g businesses want to be able to speak to governments and i know from my own work with the exhibition organizers that we work with there's a big focus now on getting the g element to come to the exhibition um, and and then of course there's there's the b to end user where you uh, uh, and, and actually that's probably a diminishing role for exhibitions because we get information in so many ways now that actually trotting <coughs> off to the exhibition to see the latest release is probably not the way we inform <coughs> our buying decisions so i think b to b and b to g are the two primary roles now that are going to develop and probably b to i which is business information looking at where, 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 trend, where things are moving and what the trends are. I think we can gauge that from attendance at exhibitions, particularly international exhibitions. Thank you very much, Andrew. If we could thank all of the panellists. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.